Oh, you want restoration? You want new parts? This is a long video, so let's get going. And it's very Land Rover specific. So if you're not into that, well, there's something wrong with you. When you buy new bolts from Land Rover parts suppliers, often they come uncoated. Or in this case, I think they've been lightly black oxide treated. They're not going to stay looking fresh for long. So I'm going to electroplate them. I tried a vapo rust in the ultrasonic cleaner as a method to remove black oxide. <coughs> Failure. So I threw them in acid like normal. Then a double water dunk. Followed by zinc plating. And then a clear passivate. Okay. Let's start with the heart of the front and rear axles. The differentials. These are both standard open differentials. Power comes in from the drive shaft here, turns the pinion gear, which turns the crown wheel, which is bolted to the carrier. Technically, the carrier and the gears inside are the differential, not everything else. Inside the carrier, there is a shaft with two pinion gears on it. The shaft is always flipping end over end, rotating with the crown wheel. The two pinion gears can't drive both of the side gears in the same direction. Impossible. The side gears can sit still or turn in the opposite direction relative to one another. The side gears are connected through half shafts to the wheels. When the wheels are going around a corner, they are following two different radiuses, or radii traveling different distances. Thanks to the differential, the wheels can travel at different speeds. But there is a big flaw in this design. To fully explain this requires physics. But we don't need to go there. Effectively, the differential will favor the wheel with the least resistance, driving it forward, while the other wheel freewheels backwards or negatively rotates relative to the driven wheel. That's not technically what's happening but that's the net result. This is a problem when you need equal drive through both wheels. One wheel might be on solid ground with good traction, but that means nothing if the other wheel is in fresh air or digging a hole in sand. The side with good traction will sit still while the wheel in fresh air spins its nuts off. The Haynes manual suggests that the differentials are so complicated you should just give up and pay a man for a new one. Nonsense. There are two very easy checks you can make before deciding what action to take, if any. First, check the backlash between the input pinion gear and crown wheel. That just means the jiggle space between the gear teeth. Land Rover say 8 to 10 thousandths of an inch. Checking the rear diff first, it's showing about 10 thousandths. Maybe just under. Perfect. And now the front. About the same. Ten thousandths. Perfect. The second thing to check is the contact pattern. You can buy fancy gear marking compound, or just use a whiteboard pen. Colour in a few teeth, run the gears together, and see where the marking has rubbed off. I think transmission guys would probably like to see the contact patch more towards the centre of the tooth. I think it's okay as is. If it was running off the edge of the teeth, we'd have trouble. Let's check the front diff before making an assessment. Because this truck has always had freewheeling hubs fitted, the front diff has very little mileage on it. And although the pen hasn't smoothly worn down, you can see the contact area is in the same zone. So I think we can assume that both the front and rear differentials are not very worn. And the teeth are still contacting, more or less how they were originally set up, by some guy in Solihull.
You just saw me rip one of the oil seals out. I decided it would be easier to install them with the diffs back on the axle cases. Okay, that's a lie. I mangled one of the new seals putting it in, and had to wait for another one to show up in the post. Oh, and you'll see me putting compound on the outside of the seals. I'm aware you don't have to do that with rubber seals like these. In the manual, sealing the outside refers to the older style metal encased seals. I still put gunk on the outside anyway. It doesn't do any harm, and I'm not charging by the hour. I'm using these new bungs, but I think I prefer the old outies better. For the flat brass bungs, sometimes you'll be given solid copper washers, that are fine, but I prefer the thread on crush washers. You don't have to wrench down on the plug as hard to make a good seal. In terms of getting these plugs out, some people use the back of a spanner. Do yourself a favour and make something that you can turn with a socket. The third bung hole to be bunged is the breather hole. It takes a little ball valve. The valve is supposed to let pressure out but stop water coming in. They can be a little unreliable. If the valve is stuck closed, pressure will still force its way out, just through the oil seals instead. Alright, now we can start adding to either end of the axles. We'll put the rear stub axles on first. I like copper anti seize The stub axles are a tight fit over their flange, a little slippery will help the next guy. And I also smear a little on the face of the stub axle itself. In this case, just as a rust preventative. You could paint this face if you wanted. They do get crusty otherwise, though that's not really a problem. And these bolts that hold the stub axle on are all Whitworth. Alright, let's move on to the front axle now. Unlike the rear axle, the front axle has oil seals at either end to 
keep the axle oil separate from everything else. Once the oil seals are in, we can attach our chrome swivel balls. First, we have to prepare them with new parts. This basically involves bashing your balls between two pieces of wood. First, driving out the old Ralco bush. And then the old bearing race. This is the new Ralco bushing. This and the pin that goes inside it are the parts that people worry about getting destroyed if you run freewheeling hubs. I'm bashing the new bushing in with a copper hammer. If you only have a hard hammer, you can put the old pin back in and bash the top of that instead. It's going in pretty easy. It might not look like it, but I'm not hitting it very hard. When you buy a swivel rebuild kit, you'll get some cheap generic bearings. These are basically your steering, and half of what holds the wheels on. So I won't be using these nasty unbranded bearings. Same deal for the bearing race. I'm reusing these original roller bearings. They seem fine. These bearings support the front half shafts, and they go in pretty easy. So the lower tapered roller bearing that sits in the bearing race we just installed is a press fit over these steering arms. But it's not actually a press fit. It's a loose fit. You can see the burning where the bearing has been spinning. So you might assume the pin has worn undersize. But it hasn't. It measures perfectly round. Here's a new pin. Same deal, a loose fit. I get why Land Rover did this, to make disassembly a lot easier. They must be relying on the axial force pushing down against the shoulder of the steering pin to stop the bearing spinning. But what happens is that the outer race starts to wear, and then the rollers favour one spot, which accelerates wear even more. I guess to the point that the bearing stops rolling and just spins around the pin. I'll come back to this after we fix the steering arm to the swivel housing. Land Rover specify retaining Loctite in here. 
I've put a whiff of copperies on the studs. I don't want to contaminate the Loctite, but the studs can get a little seized in place over time. They are a very tight fit. Back to this pin and bearing. Yeah, I'm going to lock tight it on. I get that Land Rover left it loose to make disassembly easier, but I'll deal with that problem in a few decades time. So the steering arms and roller bearings go in the bottom. The top pivots around this solid pin, which sits in the Rolco bushing. These shims sit under the top pin, but their purpose is to adjust the preload on the roller bearing. Because I've replaced the bearings, the shims that were in the vehicle before aren't really relevant, but for the sake of a start point, I'm using the same full stacks that came out. The rebuild kits come with a selection of new shims. You set the steering or bearing preload with a fish scale. We're aiming for between 8 and 10 pounds. First attempt is way too tight. Correcting the preload is tedious but easy. Just add or subtract shims until it's about right. You're supposed to torque the pin down properly before taking a measurement each time, but I'm not doing that because it's way too much hassle. And there we are, perfect. I'll double check that after the top bolts are fully tightened with the torque wrench, but it's not going to make much difference. And here's the other side, same deal. The next job is to install the swivel seal. It's pretty easy, it's just a giant oil seal. I put gasket compound on the outside, plenty of grease on the inside, and then attach the retainer plate, just loosely at first, and give the swivel 
A swivel to make sure the seal is wiping evenly. In case you're wondering, yeah, I replaced these swivel balls not long ago. They do get chipped by stones, and then rust sets into the chrome, and then of course they don't seal properly. It's just something that happens over time. And um, look, I'm really sorry, but the original cut was way too long, and I couldn't bring myself to sit down and edit it all in one go. So...